Welcome. Good to see you here this morning for our series on God and the Modern Wing. Last Sunday we had Cam Anderson here and it was a great time, some of you were here for that, to look at the artwork of Brandon Cousy and Jack Cometti. Um, I'm not going to repeat the whole talk, but for me it was great because I love those uh, two artists and sculptures and he says they are maybe the greatest of the 20th century. I don't know, he's the expert, I'm just the observer. But what I thought was especially illuminating was the way in which Brancusi, especially in the Golden Bird, which we have here in our modern wing, is obsessed with the transcendent. The modern bird just reaching up in its simplicity to heaven. And then Giacometti, the pinched and emaciated looking walking man that we have here as well, uh, looks like he just walked out of the furnace. Uh, and there he is, alone, alienated. So at the end of the talk, uh, Cam said, we have here uh, art of the transcendent and art of the suffering, the alienated, but still grounded in the earth. It's, it's, it's earthy. Well, what does that make you think of? Well, here, as a theologian, I just spin off into my own territory. It makes me think of and the, the Word, the transcendent Word, became flesh. Hologo sarxigeneto, that's my area of specialty. The Word became flesh. That's huh. what we see in this Word. So that's what we're searching to see as we go to the modern wing. Uh, not all of our observation is about such theological, spiritual things. When I walk with my wife, we primarily talk about color. How did he get that green? Where did that blue come from? Look at the limited palette of Velazquez we were talking about just this week. It's just so muted, uh -huh. those muted colors. So you can look at lots of things in art. <clears throat> uh, we're very fortunate today to have Matt Milner, uh, whose uh, biography you have a little sketch of in your handout there, if you have the handout. Uh, MA and PhD from Princeton in Art History, at MDiv in Theology from uh, Princeton and one of my all-time favorite lectures on art history. So we're very grateful to have him this week. Next week we have Tim Lowley, a great artist from North Park University. And after the session next week, uh, we're going to go to the Modern Wing. Well, not directly. We need lunch first and we're on our <laughs> own for lunch, uh, wherever you want to get lunch. Darlene and I are going to go to where well, we usually go when we go to uh, the AIC, we go to Terzo Piano, which is this wonderful restaurant on the top floor of the Renzo Piano building that we have here in Chicago. What a beautiful place that is. So if you want to join us for lunch, we're going to go right there from uh, class, and then we'll meet together, all of those who want to, at 1.30 uh, in the uh, reception or opening area of the Modern Wing and then walk through and see, in person, some of the art that we are enjoying. <clears throat> Let's pray. Great God, our Creator, you have made a world which has so much beauty for us to enjoy and given us senses to enjoy it. And you have made us in your image that we also might be makers and creators. We ask that your Spirit, who inspires and illumines and gifts us will guide us now to see with open eyes and open hearts the work of artists today. May we be led beyond them and beyond their work to have new understanding of ourselves and of you. We ask this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. 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 Matt, thank you for being here. I am so pleased to be here, so thank you for coming out to this. Oh, I see some Wheaton students came as well. Thank you for joining us, and for those of you I don't know, I look forward to getting to know you more. You can commission art, but you can also commission art history, and it has been so exciting to be able to look at this material freshly and to um, bring some new bearing on what the modern wing means, which comes up a lot in my lectures, but I've been, had the chance to do more original seeking as a result of this series. Now, I don't know if you have noticed Laredo Taft's personification of the Great Lakes Can lately. Use the microphone? Oh, absolutely. Yes, sir. This is Laredo Taft. A little bit closer, please. Little bit cl good idea. It's not a help if you can't hear. I'm going to come. There we go. How about that? That's 
better. There we Thank go. You. you got it. So have you seen Laredo Taft's personification of the Great Lakes? It's just staggering. And in the fall right now, it is gorgeous. And I admit to usually being interested in the older wing because I'm a Byzantine and medieval art historian and I can find God there. But one of the exciting realizations is that, of course, he's everywhere. He's in this room. He's nowhere that he is not. This is ancient Christian wisdom. And of course, he's in the modern wing as well. And discovering that over time after an overcoming an initial distaste for modern art has been one of the most exciting things in my development. And it has a lot to do with being a professor. When you're up in front, all of a sudden my prejudices, I had to get rid of them because I was infecting my students with my distaste. And I realized as I went with open eyes with more love into the modern wing that he was as present there as in the older stuff. That's my journey and I hope that I can share that with you with some preliminary remarks and then we'll look at Chagall briefly. Magritte and Dali. So that's the structure of the talk and let's get started with some preliminaries. I remember looking at the John Hancock Center transfixed as an undergraduate and not knowing what to make. Is it pride? Is it the city of man? Right, As Augustine would put it, is, but it was so captivating. It's easily the best skyscraper in Chicago in my opinion. And I couldn't make sense of it, and it just, it stuck in my mind, and it, it was wrestling. I loved it, but I didn't know how to relate to it as a believer. And then coming back to Chicago 20 years later after having this undergraduate experience, I, I have the answer, right? Mm -hmm. And the answer is Ralph Adams Cram. He has a early retort of sorts to the John Hancock Center. And of course, I hope you all recognize this. This is in Fourth Pres. And it is, the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And it is, in some senses, the dialogue between the two is what makes this city exciting. And this church has so much to do with that. And I found that it's not just this early architecture. I mean, this is contemporary with some of the stuff we're studying today, by the way. And so we could consider this modern art. It goes alongside of some of these modern interventions. Why leave this aside? Why not consider the theological statement that Cram makes before these skyscrapers are even constructed at this church? We can consider that. It's just what you're looking for. You find what you're looking for. If you want to think of Chicago as this big, bad, secular city, you can say, there's the Hancock Center, there's the twisted metal of Frank Gehry. We are now in the post-postmodern realm. No one creates anything like this. Christian architecture is left behind. But again, what are you looking for? If you go into Holy Name Cathedral, you will find that that twisted metal long predated Frank Gehry. In fact, there is a glorious sculpture of Jesus bursting from the tomb in twisted metal that, in some senses, I think is in dialogue with Frank Gehry. But again, this came first. You might even say that this beautiful piece of sculpture in Holy Name Cathedral is the original beam. But of course, the Eucharistic tabernacle is what that one is. So again, I, I'm learning to, I, to overcome this initial suspicion, and it is such a luxury to overcome that and to come to realize that Frank Gehry, I like him. I w an earlier self would be very angry at me for saying that. Um, but I've come to realize that there are beautiful moments, and this is how I've come to appreciate and understand it. Now, when we go into the modern wing, you might be confronted with things that are absolutely, deliberately bizarre, attempting to shock you. And these are there, and we're probably not going to think about them too much, so I want to get those up in the beginning. Now, what you're looking at here is Miko no Inori's video that is playing on loop in the modern wing right now. And what you've got here is a description that I've lifted from the label, unsettling high gloss dreamscapes, Maury stars and is, as an extraterrestrial character turning a cyclical ball. And while the Japanese words in the background are, the world is becoming one, the world is becoming one. The label says she is a shaman who acts as an intermediary between the earthly and spiritual realm. And so I'm sitting there looking at this, and I'm used to this kind of thing, as some of you are, and I'm like, what do I make of this? And then I start to look at her rolling this crystal over herself, 
And I realized, wait a second, this is nothing new. Some of you may know of this beautiful visitation series at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And who is it? It is the meeting of Mary and Elizabeth. And jewels are used to signify John the Baptist and Jesus that are inside. And again, I'm coming to realize that there's no reason to be weirded out by images like that. You just anchor them. There is the true bringing of the two earthly and heavenly realms together. And maybe this artist, whether she realizes it or not, is reinventing what was once a piece of art history. I shouldn't be weirded out by the modern, I realize, because we medievalists know that the Middle Ages invented the weird. They were creating things like that long before. And this is a very popular intersection right now in art history. I'm showing you three books, Medieval Modern, Depositions, Byzantine Modernism. All of these medievalists and modernists are saying, wow, this ancient Christian era has so much to do with what's going on in contemporary art. So this is not new what I'm sharing with you. I'm saying that this is a very hot topic right now. Think about this. This is James Elkins, Art Institute of Chicago, prominent art critic and theorist and art historian. Brilliant man. Ten years ago, in On the Strange Place of Religion and Contemporary Art, he said to fit in the art world, work with religious themes has to be ambiguous, self-critical, ironic. Sincere religious art has no place in the art world. That's what he said. I remember reading that in the library and saying, ah! Well, Today, this is a more recent publication, the excellent scholars of religion who are themselves religious and value their scholarship principally as a way to enrich their religious experience have shown me a different way of reading art history. He has changed his perspective as a result of going more deeply into what's going on in contemporary art. I think that's exciting. There are many publications I could refer to in this regard. University of Chicago Press, Jeffrey Kosky, The Arts of Wonder, he says in denying, brand new book, in denying themselves recourse to religious vocabulary or theological conceptuality, modern art critics give up what would be advantageous to a profound encounter with the works in question. University of Chicago Press, not some, you know, Wheaton College evangelical press on the side. This is mainstream stuff. We've left out religion. That's what's going on. <coughs> And so when we go to find God in the modern wing, we are not doing something we can't let anyone know about. We are doing something that's being encouraged. And so let's start with Chagall. Now some of you will know the sad part of this talk, and that is that it's not there. The white crucifixion that I'd like to discuss with you has been moved off to Italy for a time so that the Pope can spend time with his favorite painting. And there have been a lot of headlines about this. Walter informed me about it. And I went, oh, my heart was broken that it wasn't there. Um, this is Chicago Tribune News moving this painting. OK? Um, and, it, and it is something that you can grieve over. We've lost this for a time. This is the, the core, the fulcrum around which the whole modern wing turns. And we've lost it for a time. But it is just sharing. That's what we're doing. We'll get it back. There it is being shipped away. And let's, let's look into more who this artist is. Of course, you know him from the blue windows at the Art Institute. You know him from the amazing mosaics down the way. But let's talk about him more deeply. So he is from Belarus. And he is exiled to France and then exiled to the United States. And he goes back and forth. But a, a fascinating career. And it's interesting, isn't it, that he is from Belarus. But in the Olympics, Russia seemed to claim him as their own. <laughs> and so I can see some Belarus people saying, oh, no, what does this mean? But nevertheless, you may have noticed in that opening sequence that wonderful, uh, create, almost like an operatic recreation of Chagall paintings. And he is a Jew, and you can get a sense of his Jewish playfulness and his dialogue with his own tradition by looking at this beautiful painting in the Art Institute, these phantasmagoric landscapes. Often there is a fiddler that will appear on the roof, of course, the inspiration for that later play. And not only is he Jewish, but he is in dialogue, as is so beautifully explicated in My Name is Asher Lev. This is the inspiration for that novel. He's in dialogue with the culture of art as well. I love this quote. I would rather think of my parents, who are his parents? 
Rembrandt, my mother, Cezanne, my grandfather, my wife. He mixes together Rembrandt, Cezanne, and his wife and his grandparents. This is who brought him into the world, both physically but also creatively. He is also, therefore, a modern artist. He is inspired both by the long art historical past Rembrandt but also by Cezanne. And this looks like a piece of abstract art that you would encounter in different bits of the modern wing, but some of you may see the trick here. I'm just zooming in. This is his The Praying Jew. And, I'm just, and I'm, he is inspired by Cubism as he puts this together. Notice those moves. He is, I wouldn't say haunted by his past. He is delighted by it. And they say the story behind this painting is he finds someone to model for him to recall his father praying. You have the tefillin, the prayer phylacteries at the top, which look again like that abstract piece of art, and the talith, the prayer shawl that he has as well. So he knows this heritage. He doesn't try to suppress it. It is a part of who he is. And so already you see this assertion of the Jewish people of God in the modern wing as you walk through the, the chronological sequence. But it wasn't just Jewish art. My heart was quiet with the icons. Was quiet, sorry, but the typo, was quiet with the icons. This is Chagall after seeing the icon collection of Alexander III in 1910. And look at that recreation of that ancient Byzantine icon that he gives us there. Isn't that fascinating? He is, he in some senses is resisting the Russian iconic tradition, but at the same time he's inspired by it. And we know now that it was when Henri Matisse went to the Russian icon show in 1913, he said, what is this? Where was this all my life? There's been all of this research into realizing how the icon is behind so much modernity. You might even call modern art a revival of the Christian icon. That's one way of seeing it. This is very pervasive. And it was forgotten because Russia did a really good job of forgetting the religious backdrop. And now we have realized just how much research is to be done in the iconic backdrop of these modern artists. And then in regard to Rembrandt, he can't get away from him either. Look at that echoing. That's, of course, the Jewish bride. Neither Imperial Russia nor Soviet Russia needs me. I'm certain Rembrandt loves me. <laughs> Chagall says that. Now we might see some weird issues that he has there. No, he's just deeply perceptive because Rembrandt was finding Jewish models in Amsterdam and using them to paint Jesus. He perceived that sympathy to the Jews in Amsterdam and he saw that sympathy rebounding to himself as a Jew as well. And then he breaks this theme into his painting, dedicated to Christ, 1912. He paints a child, a baby, being crucified. Where does this come from? Why would this Jewish artist avail himself of that Christian motif? Again, this is what my name is Asher Lev is wrestling with. He has to avail himself of that. And what is he responding to? We know exactly what he was responding to in this haunting image. Because he tells us. In 1977, he said, for me, Christ has always symbolized the true type of the Jewish martyr. This is how I understood him when I used the figure for the first time, under the influence of the pogroms, the persecution of the Jews. Then I painted and drew him in the pictures about ghettos surrounded by Jewish troubles, by Jewish mothers running terrified with little children in their arms. When he sees the persecution of the Jews, he uses this to say, hey, Christians, what are you doing? You're crucifying your Lord again. And he's right. That's why he uses that theme. But then for 20 years, it goes away. What brings it back? That's the question. Well, you know the answer. The French army could have crushed him. 7th of March, 1936. Just give me a little land. All of his advisors said, Hitler, don't do it. They will crush you. He said, trust me, I got this. Mm -hmm. He sends his army in. He gets a little piece of land. Mm -hmm. And they do not respond. If they had responded then, it might have been over. What happens when Hitler gets some land? He wants a little bit more. Warmonger, they said to the person who tried to stop him then, <laughs> Winston Churchill. Relax, this guy's going to be okay. 
<laughs> Peace in our time, says Neville Chamberlain coming out, and Hitler knows exactly who he's dealing with and says, this guy's weak. He's not going to stop me. Can I have a little bit of living room, says Hitler? Some Lebensraum. I mean, we, we German people, we've we got we to move around. And it was this conquest, look at all that, from Germany, all of that area is taken. And, and the powers, understandably, I mean, for goodness sakes, World War I is still in their purview. They don't want to go through another war. Maybe that's why, they, but they didn't stop him. And 77 years ago, tomorrow, tomorrow is the anniversary of Kristallnacht. Because when these lands were taken, the Jews were persecuted, their storefronts were smashed, which is why the night of broken glass, the translation. And here are images of what happened to the people in this living room that Hitler wanted. When you go to Berlin today, you will see this beautiful synagogue that has been reconstructed. And if you ever, you see it dominating the skyline, it's wonderful. But then you go inside and you realize it's just a facade. The back just gives you a sense of how big the church once, or the, I'm sorry, the synagogue once was. You can even see one of the candles that was lit signifying the presence of God in the Torah that was recovered. That's all that is left. And it is one of the most, oh, this architecture of penitence in Berlin. Yes, the Jewish Museum is wonderful, go to it. But there is something about this haunting footprint of that massive, beautiful synagogue that was once there and is there no more. Why is it gone? Of course, you can see on the plaque, from Kristallnacht. There in the German, never forget. That is why Chagall paints this. He goes back to the theme because he sees more persecution. And what's amazing about this image is the illuminating complexity. I mean, he brings illumination on the complexity of 20th century politics. You want to understand 20th century politics? Here it all is. Because there on the right are the brown shirts, Hitler's goons, destroying the synagogue. And on the left are the communists. But he doesn't choose either, does he? Neither left nor right. But right in the middle, you have the light of God shining on injustice. Now that is, for me, the answer to any Christian political question. Do you want the left? view? Do you want the right view? Or what about the light of God? Now, of course, we can't see it exactly, but we can try. What would God say to this injustice? Well, first of all, he sees it. And you can see on the bottom there, ik bin Judy. You can just barely, this sense of the man having to wear that placard. You see someone running away with the Torah scrolls. There are synagogues in New York City that have some of those Torah scrolls that were saved from Kristallnacht. It's incredible to see them. And then you have the refugees up there attempting to escape, which reminds us of the refugee crisis that we're facing right now. And you have the candle, the only sign of hope at the bottom. There's that prayer shawl again. Jesus is suffering with his people. And it gets worse. The crucified 1944. Chagall reads the headlines. He knows what is happening. He doesn't leave Paris until 1941. Everyone's saying, get out of here. And then when they started to revoke citizenship for the Jews in occupied German Paris, he said, honey, this is the first step to concentration camp. We need to leave. And that's why he finds himself in New York. And so he does an image of no hope this time. No hope. The, that woman with the baby that you see in the bottom, there she is, frozen with her child. And you have Jews crucified. And that fiddler on the roof, that joyful motif, is nothing but a man holding a sacrificed ox up on the roof. He's mourning through his painting. This is like Walt Whitman wondering whether or not his poetic gifts can withstand the Civil War. 
And Chagall is wondering the same thing. But there's hope as well. Descent from the cross, at the same time, 1941, there is this playful rooster that is taking this man down from the cross. And who is the man? You can see up at top, Mark C.H. It's Mark Chagall. He's being crucified with his people. He sees himself as Jesus. He actually says in some of his poetry, I am crucified like Christ. He, he knows the Yiddish Psalm 22. He has it memorized. He quotes it. And there you can see the person bringing back his easel and brush. See the angel bringing that to him? Keep painting through this. Amazing. Maybe this gets at it as well. A triptych, resistance, resurrection, and liberation. Rembrandt, Masaccio, and Grunewald, but perhaps Grunewald is the greatest, says Chagall. And Aaron Rosen has seen in this echoes of the Grunewald Isenheim altarpiece that some of you may know. And so we look into resistance. Again, this is made over a long period of time. And this is the one time in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of May of 1943 when the Jews resisted the Germans. Now, of course, that didn't continue, but they did. And so he's saying, fight against injustice. And some people have seen a connection there, again, with that horrific Jesus who is ministering to those afflicted by the same d disease from the early 16th century on the eve of the Reformation. In his resurrection series, people think, well, this is a very Jewish Jesus. There's no resurrection. Well, wait a second. There is. And he calls it the resurrection. And some people see that pointing figure of John the Baptist on the right there, that that might be Chagall imitating that posture on the side of the cross. Notice in this one, there he is. He's dead. He cannot paint at the bottom the red figure. And now he is able to point again and, yes, indeed, in the more robust liberation, almost a direct quotation of the Isenheim resurrection. Amazing. And look, there's the artist. And there's that fiddler again. This was completed in 1952. He's working through this as the world goes through this crisis. How are we to think about this Jewish artist who makes these, can we call them Christian paintings? Some have said, keep in mind, this is him just using the tradition despite itself to call Christians to task, and that would be fair. But he has Catholic friends. Raisa Maritain and Jacques Maritain were close to him. These Catholic theorists about art, they're fantastic thinkers. And as it is put by Raisa, Christ entendu à travers le monde perdu, right? Christ spread across the lost world. Because Raisa was a Jew herself, she had converted to Catholicism. And so that was one of those connections. And she sees her faith painted in this image. Again, Aaron Rosen, whom I find so illuminating in this regard, he has a brand new book on art and religion in the 21st century. He says that through their persecution of Jews, the painting declares Christians crucify the very essence of their faith. That's his claim about this painting. But I want to make an even stronger claim. <laughs> I think it's actually even worse. It's not just that we're crucifying the essence of our faith if Christians involve themselves in this kind of violence against Jews. I think we are actually crucifying Jesus. He identifies with his people. How else can we understand the Holocaust other than seeing him there suffering with them? Matthew 25, whatsoever you did to the least of these. I want to go deeper with that claim and saying because he's the risen Lord who is with the afflicted, this painting is absolutely correct. That's what happens when injustice goes down. And it's so astonishing. This enables him to navigate the difficulty so we go from the 1912 iconic fiddler and then he goes back to the fiddler by 1947. And this is the Chagall who fills the beautiful Paris Opera House, who gives us the blue windows, who gives us his mosaic for Chicago. He's returned to his aesthetic gifts because Christ helped him throw it. <laughs> wow. What do we make of this? So much. I love thinking about icons and 
This just gives you an image. Those stars are churches dedicated to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, an icon that I love to study. Here's one example of it. Um, it just rings Chicago. You have Jesus and Mary and the angels bearing the instruments of the Passion. And as I've been studying this and looking at all the churches dedicated to the image in Chicago, I said, wow, Mark Chagall painted one of them too. <laughs> you have almost like a virgin and child looking up at the fate. Wouldn't it be wonderful to spend the rest of the morning on Chagall, but we, we ah, oh, it's incredible. I mean, I, I, I love this city. I have, as a young man walking through it, it just it was my first love as a city. I just, I, I've been around, but I come back here and I say, this city is beautiful. And then I go to the Chagall mosaics and I see that beautiful rose window. It's like the city itself is a cathedral. And I'm like, yes, he expresses it, but he works through it, through the difficulty to be able to give us that beautiful public art that we have here. I'm cheating. I, I said, let's be done with Chagall, but I go back to him. Let's talk about René Magritte. A whole different way of approaching things. How many people went to the show? Wonderful. It was about as good as it gets as a compilation of this Belgian artist's career. And we got a fantastic opportunity. And if you, Please don't ever make the mistake of missing these big shows when they come. I have some shows that I could have gone to that I didn't, but it's so much work of borrowing that goes into this that it's usually one-time opportunities. So um, I don't mean to say that to make all of you feel bad, but just for future shows, make sure you get to these because these things are fleeting. But when we went to this Magritte show, you began to, of course, get a sense of what he's about and you can get a wonderful sense when you go to the Art Institute. We have a, some really good Magritte holdings in the modern wing. And this is the painting that I think helps me understand him. Um, I don't want to be a Freudian and kind of psychoanalyze artists. I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. But nevertheless, it's kind of hard to ignore this connection. His mother was discovered in the Seine, in, in the river, um, with her nightgown around her face drowned when he was a boy. And so this is going to be a damaging thing for a young man. And he was known as the, the son of the dead woman. And so just imagine the emotional trauma that's going on there. And now all of a sudden it's not, it, it's, whoa, hold on, is that haunting him? Perhaps maybe he saw the image of his mother with her nightgown. We, it's, it's a mystery. Did she commit suicide? Was it an accident? But, oh, wow. So oh, this helps me see in some senses what he's about. He is involved in advertising, and he decides that modern art is going to be his way of undoing the advertisements which are always taken at face value. That's one way of understanding him. From Trompe l'oeil, the trick of the eye, which was the Renaissance realism, right? Oh, it looks like a real thing. Oh, you must be a good artist. He's like, okay, I can do that, but I want to get more interesting. I want to trick your spirit. I want to trick your mind. Trompe l'esprit. And that is a, just a, a shot of what you'll see in the Art Institute right now. You see one of his, the feast, a painting of the sunset over there. And then you have this bizarre conglomeration. It looks like is it the four elements. What's going on with this World War I cannon aimed at it all? What's going on there? Here's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, having puzzled over these a lot, don't puzzle over them too long because I don't think they can be figured out. He doesn't want you to figure them out. He wants you to look with fresh eyes at the mystery of reality. And that is really clearly expressed. Susie Gablet's book on the Greek is really fun and interesting in, in it unraveling this theme throughout his life. And he said himself, th now look at this, th what you're seeing here is a painting in front of a window. So it's a painting of a painting in front of a window. And where we're standing, you can just see the edge of the canvas there, he has perfectly mirrored reality. And the painting is called The Human Condition. This is how we see the world. We see it as being outside ourselves, even though it's only a mental representation of that we experience inside ourselves. So he's asking you to question the way that reality comes into your mind and you just assume what's going on there. He wants you to look as a child would look. 
what is going on? I, I, I don't understand that because we've gotten used to everything. So these are in some senses like smelling salts for your perception. Wake up, he's saying. All of reality is this weird. You've just gotten used to it. The mystery of reality is what he's getting at. And now he gets us. And I think he, this is what he's trying to do. And I think we need to be gotten in this regard. Okay? Here's the, he did an English translation of the famous painting as well. This is a senior pound beat, but this is not a pipe. Now, what is going on with this? This becomes his slogan, right? They had, you could buy uh, T-shirts at the Art Institute show with this on it, ties and everything. And, and he would, in some sense, I think, be a little bit like, wait, don't you understand? I was trying to undo all of that, but now you're selling it again. This is a theme throughout his career. He does the first one in the 1920s, and he returns to it again and again and again. And what is he trying to say? The Freedom of Worship, 1946, he sometimes gussies it up, and he's like, hey, I've made the pipe look really good. Do you, do you think it's a pipe? <laughs> well, what's really cool is the one we have at the Art Institute is one, that he, one of the last ones that he, did, that he did. It's called The Tune and Also the Words, and has the senior found peep. And what he has done now, unlike the earlier ones, he lit it up. And he has a fancy frame that's like coming out at you. And he's saying, okay, I've done all this to it. Do you think it's a pipe yet? <laughs> he's, of course it's not a pipe. It's just an image of a pipe. He's talking about the treachery of images. That's what the first one's called. And yet, somehow we have turned him into just some fancy artist. He is saying that we are spending our lives deceived by the images that constantly appear in front of us. This was one of my favorite of the Magritte advertisements that was around Chicago. It's like, hold on now. Is that who you are? That image that you took of yourself? Magritte would be laughing and saying, come on. It's just an image. And we advertising seduced 21st century citizens of the world are like this, stuffed with pipes all over. That is, things that we thought were the real thing that were sold to us. I think this is a haunting image. He's trying to say question reality, which sounds like a cheap slogan, but I think it's at the core of Christian aesthetics, at the core of it. This is the ecumenical heritage of iconoclasm. Now, we don't have time to go into in great detail, but I will simply say that the greatest argument ever made against images in the Christian tradition, against images of Jesus, is this one right here that you're looking at. Constantine V was an emperor in the iconoclastic era in Byzantium, and he said, you can't depict an image of Jesus because you can't depict his divine nature, that's not good, and you can't depict his human nature, not possible, and if you, you, you will necessarily separate one or the other, and if you know your early Christian theology, you can't separate them. They're mysteriously united. That's the Council of Chalcedon. And so Constantine said this, and the images were being removed, and he was winning on the battlefield, and it could have been that we didn't have this wonderful Christian art history with these images of Jesus. But what happened was, a man named Theodore the Studite from the Studion Monastery said, hey, Constantine, you're forgetting something. You're forgetting the Chalcedonian formula, the person of Jesus is the missing element. And that is what Christian icons do. He agrees. I don't want to depict the divine nature. I can't mediate that. That's beyond my possibility. And I don't want to make Jesus an Arian, just kind of a mere human. But the person of Jesus is that missing element. And the icon only indirectly reflects it. And so, every, and so oftentimes you're reading people talking about the iconoclastic controversy and they will throw Magritte, Socinia, Paul, and Pipi. They're like, look, that's early Christianity. And they're right. And I have made an argument. You can, if you want to hear more about it, we can talk. I think John Calvin would have totally agreed with this, but he did not have these sources at his command. He had John of Damascus, an earlier phase of the image controversy that he disagreed with. But if he had had this, maybe he would have seen that the Eastern Orthodox and the Reformed are really not that very far apart. Maybe. And who cares if he didn't? We can. <laughs> right? Because we have information that he's not responsible for, but we are. That's what's wonderful about this. To hold on to your heritage as Presbyterians and the iconoclasm. Don't give up on it, even though you're interested in art. You need it, because you need it for those images out there that Magritte is telling you not to be deceived by. 
By the way, I have not found a thing about this in the catalogs about Magritte's exhibition, but no one is pointing out that there were flickers, and I mean that term literally, of hope. Fire in Magritte's work is always an element of transcendence, says Susie Gablick. The transition between the inanimate and the animate, one of, one of the cosmic mysteries. And I love this because earlier Gablick tells us, you know, you can't decode his paintings, they're beyond understanding, but then she's like, oh no, they, they can be understood. And I love this inconsistency. Look at that image, that burning tuba, right? Maybe there is this hope, this possibility of transcendence. And yes, as you walk through that show, I know you saw the girl eating the birds and, and the dead birds, and it's like, ah, oh, this is dark and horrible, and maybe necessarily we need to be reminded of that. But I think chase the birds in Magritte, which nobody talks about, and you can see the elements of hope. Favorable omens, 1944, just as World War II is beginning to end. Is that just a trompe l'esprit? <laughs> or is there something more going on in these images? I don't think there has been enough written about the hopeful Magritte, because that's more unfashionable. But I think it's there if you want to find it. And it's certainly there in our last artist, Salvador Dali. When you go, you will see these images. Venus de Milo with drawers, one of the most famous of Salvador Dali's paintings, and visions of eternity. And is it like, is it Magritte all over again? Right? Yeah, you can't decode it. It's just trying to mess with your mind. There is certainly some of that going on with Dali. Let's talk about his life a little bit. So he is part of a radical filmmaking enterprise that catches the early film, that catches the attention of the surrealists. And he, there he is right in the middle of the in crowd. So he has made it. He's with the cool kids. And he begins to develop a following, and as often happens, that following leads to jealousy. And so Andre Breton, the co-founder of Surrealism, is kind of upset at him, saying you're, you're not sufficiently left politically, and that's a controversial issue with Dali's career. Kicks him out of Surrealism. He's like, that's all right. I'll become a classic. Dali will become a classic. He returns to classical painting. But not before giving us the most famous of the surrealist images. Of course, The Persistence of Memory, 1931. And to choose an example we have at the Art Institute, Invention of the Monsters, 1937. Now, as we zoom in on this wonderful picture, you can see, I don't think the fire symbolizes transcendence this time. I think there is a malevolent darkness in this painting that, of course, is evocative of the very things that are going on leading up to the conflict of the Second World War. And you can see a, a self-portrait disguised, a menacing one there in the background. And again, all of that, they're attempting to use Freud and illustrate him and get at the subconscious with these images. But there is, again, all this malevolence in the background. You have this strange altar with these figures. But again, this is the con. Who knows what's going on here? Is it some kind of black mass? We don't quite know. Again, it's intended to puzzle you. And this is the Dali that most people were interested in. And in 1942, he gives us an autobiography where he says, the last word of which, I fear I will die without faith. He just, that's it. He ends his own career. And for so long, that's where art historians stopped paying attention at that point. Okay, we know Dali, he looks back, he's a surrealist, end of the story, he you know, doesn't have faith, etc. Okay, there we go, he, he, it's from the horse's mouth, so you can believe it. But his career continued. I like to tell my students, you know, he was born again. <laughs> Geopoliticus child watching the birth of the new man, 1943. <laughs> There he is, emerging again. Now it's, oh, hold on, now I'm you know, projecting, projecting religion onto these paintings. No, he is telling us this. 
The Temptation of St. Anthony, 1946. This is the single most illuminating painting for understanding this shift in his career, in my opinion. Why? Because he takes all that wild surrealist imagery, all that stuff that Freud helped him chart, and he says, you're crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. <laughs> He finds a place for it. Of course Freud is right. He's the wonderful theorist of original sin. But that's not the whole story. What happens when those sins are transformed? Like that bird. <laughs> that's what happens with Dali's career. After the atomic bomb, that's what set it off for him. Um, he wrote the mystical manifesto. He went around on lecture tours saying, why I was an atheist and now am a mystic. And people still are having a hard time like, taking him at face value. Yes, indeed, he returns to Spanish Catholicism. And about as deeply as you can imagine, this is an image painted in response to St. John of the Cross's vision in the 16th century. And he has connections, because he's a celebrity, with the monks at the St. John of the Cross's monastery, and they show him this, and he says, you know, that is really nice. Why don't I turn it into one of the most famous paintings of Jesus ever? <laughs> A Christ as beautiful as the God that he is, says Dali. This is a translation of the great mystic. That's what this, oh, it's incredible. And that, I believe, is how we have to understand the paintings and sculptures by Dali in the Art Institute. We don't have his Christian phase there. You need to know about it. But when you see his Christian phase, you can make connections, obvious connections. From his Divine Comedy series, there's the Venus de Milo with drawers. Shows up again. Because thanks to this commission, and commissions are so important, if it wasn't for this physician who commissioned the Divine Comedy series, who knows? His faith might have died on the vine. But people encouraged him along the way. No church ever gave Dali a full commission. Nope. It had to be private enterprise. So a, a, a Catholic on the side, remember that. Christians were afraid of him. But he is struggling, and he finds through hell the place for all that surrealist imagery. That's where he puts it. I cannot think of a more... When I saw this, I was like, what? I've seen that before. Hold on. That's the one in the Art Institute, Visions of Eternity, with that kidney bean down there, maybe the beginnings of something, and then he finds the place for those looming figures in purgatory. Or this, in this case, in the Inferno, I believe. We could actually do the Nicene Creed with Salvador Dali, I believe in God the Father Almighty. He's very intelligent. He does not depict the face of the Father in the Ecumenical Council, 1960. Creator of heaven and earth. Film series he did, Chaos and Creation. <laughs> was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. That's what happens to Venus. He looks to the Virgin Mary instead. Crucified under Pontius Pilate. The third day he rose again and ascended into heaven. It's incredible. That's Dali, holding the mystical three dimension, the, the cube from the fourth, fifth, sixth dimension. What happens when a hypercube, they call them, mathematically enters this world? It unfolds into a cross. That's a mathematical fact. And he's like, that is the symbol of God coming down to earth. What Walter shared with you, that interpretation about the incarnation, oh, it's not grasping. With Dali, it's right there. He's holding the one who, ah, this, this idea of the gospel. It's incredible. And when I get frustrated at contemporary art, and I do, <laughs> I say, hey, maybe the story's not done with Jeff Koons, right? He loves Dolly. He met him. And he, he's inspired by him. And so maybe Koons' conversion is around the corner. You never know. The last thing I'll say before we do Q&A, and this is pretty, pretty interesting, okay? We don't just have to hope that this might happen. This is controversial, what I'm about to say, but let me just take a moment to talk about David Adjai. Now, some of you will have been to the show. It's in the Modern Wing, so it's part of, we can make it part of this series. And you go up to the top, and you see this. This is the plan for it. This sculpture called Horizon. This is an architect who is doing the Smithsonian Museum of African Art History on the in Washington, D.C. I mean, this guy is big deal. And this is his mid-career overview at the Art Institute. It's an amazing show. And it culminates with this. Now, you might say, OK, just this conceptual piece of sculpture. You kind of walk in, and, and you, you, know, you stand in there, and you see this photograph at the end. Well, that's interesting. 
Well, what is the photograph? Anyone know? Anyone look at the label? It's the Sea of Galilee. In an interview, he says, people ask him about, why did you put the Sea of Galilee in this? Well, this was my own photograph, which I took standing at the edge of that lake last year. I was there as a young child, and I knew this was part of some experience I had. It is a curious moment. At one point, I think that the use of the photograph makes the work weaker in terms of strict architectural criteria. But then I am realizing the hopelessness of the inability of most people to read things which are blatantly obvious. My question is, is this prominent architect saying, hey, I didn't just pick any shoreline. I had an experience at the Sea of Galilee, and you are so thick-headed, you can't see the blatantly obvious. He said it. Does that mean that he isn't secret Christian? I don't know. All I know is what the modern wing tells me, and that's pretty exciting. So I hope you spend time in there and contemplate what it would look like for Jesus to appear walking on that horizon. Thank you so much for your attention. Time for questions? Oh, wonderful. If anyone has any questions, thoughts, comments, things I missed, things you would want to point out? Yes, sir. It's a little sentence here at the end of your bio. It says that you recently appointed a member of the Curatorial Advisory Board of the United States Senate. Yes. What are they acquiring? Uh, you know, it's funny. With, there is, they acquire so much. Why? Gifts from ambassadors who come in. You want, and you, the senator can't take that home with him, right, or her. And so it has to be uh, stored in a way as, as our possession, right, as the people. And that's what the Curatorial Advisory Board is there to assist with what to make sense of that collection. Also with the architecture of the Capitol itself, which always transcends contemporary politicians' ambitions. The architecture is there for the long haul. So that is the curatorial board there is to assist in that work, which is important work, because in some senses it's given me a real pause. I, I tend to, perhaps like you, get so frustrated when I look at the political scene, because I, I, I like what Chagall was saying instead. But when I look at the aesthetic dimension of the capital, I tend to see things in a more positive light. So that's what that's involved in. Thank you. you got it. Yes, ma'am. Matthew, if you could have thrown in a fourth and fifth. Oh. Well, so many of them, the good ones were taken up by the other part of this series. So I encourage you to come back. I just, I mean, I know that Cam did a fantastic job, and, and I know that Tim and Joel are as well. So honestly, when, I, when Walter commissioned this series, I, these are the ones I picked. But oh, I would have, I would, would have picked Picasso and Brancusi. The thing about Picasso is that Modern Wing is arranged so beautifully because that little part where Chagall is, um, is w on both sides you have Otto Dix and Max Beckmann. And Beckmann is now t has taken the place of the white crucifixion. And the reason I would probably choose those if we had to go above and beyond is because they were Antarctica, right? That's the German word degenerate. Hitler was an artist, not a very good one. And he hated this kind of modern art that we talked about. I think the white crucifixion is, in a sense, the painting designed to evoke more of Hitler's ire than any painting in the world. He, I mean, it, it's modern, it's Jewish, he would just detest it. And so Beckmann and Otto Dix were involved, they were part of the degenerate art that Hitler tried to purge when he created this. And with the funny thing, of course, about the degenerate art exhibition in Munich, which was just a block away from the art that Hitler liked, the classical stuff, is that more people went to see the degenerate art, to see Max Beckmann and others. And what's really exciting, when you hang out in Berlin, you're like, oh, this great German artist, Max Beckmann, who also has crucifixions, right? I want to see all the art, I'm here in Berlin. You can't. Why can't you? <laughs> Well, he got kicked out. You know who has all the good Max Beckmans? St. Louis and the Art Institute. They're here. And so, especially St. Louis, that's the, because he taught there for a while. That's where the best Max Beckmans are. And so that's, I think, would be a really interesting way to proceed in looking into that. And Otto Dix gave us these weird Grunewald-like triptychs to mourn World War I. And so 
That's where I would go. <laughs> you got it. Any other questions or comments? I, I really have to be tentative about this, David. I think I'm just like, what? There is like a prayer chapel in the middle of the modern wing right now. I'm like, and, and when he said that blatantly obvious thing, but I have, this is so new that I want to dig more into it um, and, 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 and find out maybe, I, who knows. But it's like, from what I see, it's, wow, it's incredible that that's up there. So go experience it, right? And uh, you know what? Be subversive. Use it for prayer. <laughs> right? They can't stop you, right? Why not? Be part of the great, you know, little million flowers bloom, all perspectives come in. Come on in, use it, you know. It's, it's wow. I mean, I, I did that. I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow, what if, I mean, in some senses, this is the condition of contemporary art. We know God, well, we know God is there, but will he appear? Will he appear? This is, in some senses, what it's like when you walk into a gallery. I hope you are, are approaching it with expectancy, like this photograph of the Sea of Galilee asks you to approach. Go ahead. Now, what got you start, started on the study of art and when did you get started? Wonderful art history professor John Walford, when I was an undergraduate at Wheaton, showed me, modeled a passion for this subject matter and I just got hooked. When I saw someone else loving this subject publicly, it was contagious. So that was 20-some years ago. But then I had this bug for ministry, and some people are called to ministry. And I, just, I thought, well, you know, if I'm really a Christian, you know, that's, that's where the, that's the you know, major leagues, that's where, the real, that's where people... And then it was this long, and still is a struggle of, of, I feel the Lord's calling, saying, you know what? You can do other things. And in fact, you might be called in this other direction. God bless those who are called to ministry. But of course, if we are the ministers of the church, whether or not we're ordained, then we have to be in all these different fields of endeavor. And there are just not enough people thinking about contemporary art in this original way. And I am responsible for this to the extent that I have had influence in the sense of that infection that I told you about of hating contemporary art. And I'm like that attitude is an attitude that a lot of Christians have, probably not the people in this room. But I mean, if you want to find the bad stuff, it's not that hard. You can, but if you're looking for the good stuff and overcoming that, um, then if more and more of us do that, then we can give new spins. I'll tell you one last story. This is too interesting to not tell. There was a, I mean, you'll see Dada stuff in the Art Institute Modern Wing, and, and you'll, you'll see wonderful Marcel Duchamp's strange hat rack that looks like a spider. And you're like, well, that's wild and interesting, and it is. But, the inventor of that, more important than Salvador Dali, was Hugo Ball. Hugo Ball, with his later wife, Emmy Hennings, started the Dada movement at Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich in 1916. And his whim, as one art historian puts it, became an international sensation. And it just spread all over the world. Well, what happened was that Hugo Ball turned to Christianity. He saw that radical, daring, who knows what art is not enough. And he retroactively said, you know what Dada stands for? Everyone has this idea what it means. I know what it means. It means Dionysius the Areopagite. Dionysius the Areopagite, D-A-D-A. -D -A. Who is that? That's the great aesthetic theologian of the early Byzantine era. I mean, he's messing with people. He's like, oh yeah. That is the real avant-garde. And he started to write books about desert mystics because that is an avant-garde that's not compromised because it's truly radical. The founder of Dada did that. And when there was a lecture on it at the Art Institute, the person giving the lecture had to kind of sheepishly say, well, you know, don't, don't, go, don't go where Hugo Ball went. We want to be radical modernists here. It's like, wait a second, why not? Maybe that's the avant-garde that can endure as opposed to the one that continually gets compromised. And that's the story of modern contemporary art, the compromising of the avant-garde. You need something thicker to resist the power of our dominant culture. Oh, one last question, go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry. Do you see any role of the church today in art? I mean, historically, it played a role. Uh, this church has a little gallery. Do you see anything happening? In yes, right here. I see commissions. I see series like this that are put together, SIVA not just being in its own, on its own, but, but reaching out into broader areas, Christians in the visual arts. 
and you're going to the modern wing next time. So the question is, it's ha this is the place where it's going on. So, so please continue to do it and come back next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>